So before I start diving into my presentation to um, explain to you where we are heading next after our, um, our current equations in HEC-18, I just want to address um, a couple of things which I heard in previous presentations, and it seemed like HEC-18 equation didn't perform very well. That was kind of the impression. But um, just imagine my job or our job with my research team is to develop a design equation. So if we do experiments in a flume or in CFD and we plot all the data points which we measure and then we come up with a model, then we, of course we could fit a best fit through these data points. But we would never do this. We would always try to be conservative and add some reliability to our equations, which means that our design equation is not a best fit equation. So I'm actually not surprised to see that the HEC-18 equation doesn't match the observed because that's what we wanted. And that's why also Paul is doing his research because the current contraction, co contraction co equation is a best fit equation. And to an answer the question why the abutment equation has a different reliability is because the, the best fit equation is multiplied with a design equation. That's why it gets a better, better value. So don't be surprised to see that Hecke-Dean equation doesn't match to observe because that's what we wanted. Thank you. So, um, um, but what's next? We know HEC-18 equations have lots of issues. And as Joe mentioned, the D50 is not the way to go. And also Jean-Louis mentioned, we need really sole par um, parameters for and input, geotechnical input. So our plan is the following. First of all, um, if you ever had, ever had the chance to go to a hydraulics lab where they do a sky experiment, um, I hope you had. If not, please stop by. <laughs> what you would observe is that once you do a test in your flume, you, let's say you have a circle of P in there, that initially scour goes really fast, but then with time it kind of tapers off, and with time still, and, and it will take maybe even a day or two days till you reach an equilibrium stage in a clear water scour scenario. Which means that the assumption is pretty um, obvious that the forces actually decay as the scale forms. Or another example, if you would have like five different grain sizes, let's say one millimeter, two, three, four, five, and you would run five tests, you would have the big grain size would yield in a shallow flow depth, a scale depth, then a fine grain size. So which means that there is something going on. There is a kind of a decay as scale forms. And this is actually already, um, so, and then scale, of course, would stop where that force, that erosion force kind of meets the resistance of the soil. That's where scale would stop. And that's why we call this kind of like an equilibrium state. So we're kind of marrying the resistance of the soil with the load. Um, the load decay is actually already implemented in our current equations, but maybe you don't see it. This equation is um, right now the clear water contraction scale equation in HEC-18, um, equation 8.7 under our apartment scale chapter. And you see it includes a, a YC and a tau C. So YC is a depth and tau C is a shear or a load. And if you would take this equation and rearrange it in a form that um, looks like this, it's the same equation, we just rearrange it, so you have like tau c equals a depth, and if you plug in just randomly depth numbers, you would end up in that decay function. So it's already in there, so it's implicitly in our equations. Every equation which has a d50 in, in there could be actually turned around into a decay function. So, but we're still doing more work in, in the flume and also in CFD to bump this up into a design equation. So the other part of my talk is the resistance side. So right now, this is what we assume. We assume we have uniform bed material and that's one of the reasons we get these large scale numbers because in reality it looks we have something like this. We have layers. And every layer has its own 
resistant. Let's say you have a sandy layer, which is not very resistant, and let's say down the, you know, very deep you have a rock layer, which is very resistant. So again, the idea is to merge the load with, the, with these layers. And we will propose a couple of levels of analysis. It's depending how much money you want to spend and how much, how important maybe that bridge is. And maybe sometimes in a level two, you would have some historical bore logs. And you, if you have experience and good engineering judgment, maybe you can already kind of roughly tell what the resistance of these layers are. But of course, the uncertainty with your estimate would be very high. But there are other ways. And one way is to do some geothermal indexing. And Jean-Louis is working on a project where, for instance, you would have some geotechnical, some geotechnical um, parameters or indexes. And maybe you can find a correlation to erosion rate or critical shear to better characterize these layers. But the concept stays the same. You always kind of compare the load with the resistance. Now, there are more sophisticated ways to do it. Is one is to do an, maybe a an lab erosion test, either you use EFA or the whole erosion test or a, a device which we have in our lab. And maybe the most sophisticated one is an in situ because um, that kind of takes away that you have to take out the sample and ship it to a lab so you can do like the borehole erosion test or the ISTD, which we're going to demo tomorrow. So um, it's just a little bit focus on that level three and four analysis, how um, maybe um, geotechnical indexing could help us. And again, you would use uh, a lab device, either this one or an EFA. And what you would do is um, you would take a, a sample, push that into your flow, and um, if possible, measure shear forces simultaneously with similar roughness. And you would end up having different erosion rate data points, depending on how fast or how much flow you pump through that system. Of course, you've, if you run higher flow rates, you get high velocities, high erosion rate. But the bottom line is you have to um, use a concept where we do uh, to get that critical shear or critical water load. I want to keep it more general because um, Erosion is not only shear, there's may, way more things going on. So, um, so we, to get that critical water load, you kind of extrapolate these data points. Now, how can we merge hydraulics with geotech? This is kind of uh, um, uh, just co conceptually. So we believe that hydraulics would provide these critical water loads. That's kind of, we still believe that's uh, a hydraulics responsibility. Although, I mean, this is out for discussion. Um, and then, this is where the geotechs come in. They have lots of sophisticated um, tools. I mean, CPT or other, geophys uh, other geophysical um, techniques where they can maybe propose some advanced indexing. So they would take our critical water loads and try to correlate these loads to a geotechnical index shown here in this animation. And then they would um, come up with a model. So in a perfect world, maybe in, I don't know, 10, maybe 15 years, we don't have to do any erosion tests anymore. I mean, maybe. Um, because you could actually just use a geotechnical index, either CPT or some uh, geotechnical properties, to come up with um, these critical water loads. You could develop these curves for different soil types. And here, let's say, one in this case, um, the soil type B is, let's say, more resistant versus the soil type C. So that's why you need a, your critical water load increases because you have actually, you need more power to erode that material. Um, and the final ch um, part of the presentation is um, looking also into the future to lose more probabilistic concepts to estimate scour because um, there was actually very good work done by Ayers uh, on 2437, uh, 34. It really took a first stab at it and it was very important to build on that research. Um, for you, if you don't know what the, this is, just this is a little explanation how a probabilistic concept would work. So 
right now, if you do analysis, you just take maybe just one discharge, right? You just take one roughness number, one flow depth. But keep in mind, all these numbers have uncertainties. So you would, you need to um, develop some distributions of these uh, parameters. And also you have to relate it to a uh, bridge life. Because, you know, um, usually we, according to LRFD, we design our bridges for 75 years. And in our case, um, probably our hydrology, um, let's say uh, built-in 17B gives us um, annual discharge distribution. So that annual discharge distribution has to be converted into a 75-year discharge distribution. And then that 75-year maximum discharge distribution can then be converted into a maximum flow depth distribution and to a maximum unit discharge distribution. Let's say we want to use now the contractions calculation in a probabilistic way. You also need a distribution of the Munnings roughness. Now, you also need a distribution of your critical shear that can be done maybe through soil testing. And then you, put, you plug in actually all these distributions. So instead of plugging in numbers, you would plug in all these distributions and you would end up having finally a scour distribution. So again, you don't have to do this. This is for us in the, in the background. So we are the code writers, we are behind the scenes. You will never see all this. You will just, if it comes to probabilistic concept, the only thing what you will see is a factor you have to add to your current number. So don't worry about it. I'm just give you a little bit of an idea what happens behind the scenes. Um, this is just to give an idea of probabilistic work, but what we have in mind is something related to our decay function. Um, as I just mentioned earlier, you know, if you rearrange that contraction scale equation, you end up this, having this decay function. And let's assume you have a, a store resistance number established, a critical shear, um, that inter, uh, so that intersection between the decay and the, sh and the resistance is at this point. So at this point, you would have like a 1.5 feet contraction scale depth. But let's look at this from a probabilistic way. Um, if you have a decay function that has, of course, an uncertainty as well, so you have kind of you have confidence limits, and it's um, at the top layer, it's more uncertain. You have big fluctuations in your flow, and as the scar forms, your flow is more confined. So the uncertainty of the so the fluctuations of the load actually taper off. That's why the confidence limits, I'm sorry, kind of um, um, also decay. So if we take now a slice through one of these depths, this is how the distribution would look like. It's more flat, not like a pancake, but it's flat because you have more uncertainty. At low elevations, it's more, so the, your variation is less. Now, let's look at the distribution of that layer. In this case, we just have one layer. I mean, this method could be extended to multi-layers. And this just gives you the distribution, the uncertainty of that soil layer. Now, let's merge both of them. Um, so we first take the first cut. And what you can see here, that the resistance is to the left of the load, which is bad news. If that happens, then you have erosion, because, you have, because your load is bigger than the resistance. At a lower depth, you see the resistance is higher than the load, which indicates that your scour stops or ceases. Now, let's look at the R minus Q distributions, which gives you the exceedance probability. So in the first case, you had a huge exceedance probability, right? Because you know the resistance was to the left of your load, which you really don't want. So that gives you the first data point. And, but in deeper depth, you see you have less this is, um, exceedance probability because your load is to the left of the resistance. So if you plot all these dots together and plot them in a way, um, what you would recognize is kind of like uh, the reverse CDF, uh, C, um, CDF. So it's kind of like a reverse or a asymmetric um, cumulative distribution function. So, so that uh, line with the dots can be converted into a cumulative dif distribution function. And then once you have a CDF, you can also develop a scalar probability density function. 
And then with that, you can, if you want, you can set up some target reliabilities um, and then come up with some um, factors to meet that target. So this is kind of a little bit of a preview how a probabilistic concept would work. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.